Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Thursday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. Since I will not be doing a show tomorrow, as I mentioned, I am going to be teaching uh, assist. Well, I will be in teaching with Larry Jacobson at UCI tomorrow. So I will not uh, be here to do a show. Anyway, cheers to all of you. And we'll call this my Friday session out there. Hope you had a great day. All right. Let's uh, let's look at um, our topic du jour. Topic du jour, of course, is going to be the U.S. dollar. Benefited me nicely today watching that dollar tank as it did. Pumped up a lot of the commodities. So when I saw my large silver position benefiting greatly from this the dollar pump or dollar crash, I was pretty excited about that. So here's our graphic for it. So the U.S. dollar pumps the markets and didn't really get too much of a sign from anything that it did yesterday, right? Yesterday really wasn't that big of a, of a market move, nothing really directional. Uh, but I had the kind of gold exploding in the background up here. Gotta love AI. Isn't it funny how um, Benjamin Franklin always looks so smug? I think that if you look at the picture of Benjamin Franklin here, it's really just him looking at the markets going, I'm frustrated. In our government, I think he's probably just looking at the government going, I'm just so frustrated with what you guys are doing. But anyway, he looks all smug and angry on that $100 bill. So let's start with our chart to work our way kind of towards the top seven marketplaces. Here is the dollar index. And, you know, we, we looked at it yesterday, had a lot of volatility, right? Long topping tail and bottoming tail, but really representing a lot of indecision. Today, you had a pretty big sell-off. Now, it did just barely breach the lows that we saw on June 2nd. So that's somewhat noteworthy, but the June 2nd lows really wouldn't be that strong of a demand zone anyway. If you look at where this yellow box is, that's where we're headed right now. So I've got a box wrapped around a demand zone, which is going to go from about 102.95 up to 103 and a quarter. So that will be the the, the next stopping point I see for this one. Uh, we'll we'll see if it stops. Personally, I hope that it uh, breaks right through this and continues to drop lower because that weakening dollar out there would mean that commodity prices will continue to surge and equity markets will do rather well. So that's really what fueled it all today. Of course, you could speculate and point your fingers at a lot of different things as to why that particularly the dollar was surging. I just take it as, or sorry, I keep going backwards. The dollar was not surging. The dollar was tanking today. Um, maybe just a little bit of a relief rally here. But on the grand scheme of things, when I look at the, the big picture, let's zoom out. We have that huge head and shoulders pattern, which again, I'm going to leave there until this right shoulder is breached. I'll put a line right across the top there. Let me get some of those lines off the screen to help you out. So while it didn't work yet on that head and shoulders formation, until it breaks that right shoulder to the upside, I'm still going to keep it on your screen. Now, if it violates that top line about 106.20, then I will uh, erase all those red lines on the screen, which for many of you might be a distraction. Now, the reason I put that on there is I'm a big fan of patterns. And if you look at the, the pattern, I'll switch this over to a weekly, the pattern on the dollar index here, you know, obviously it's been extremely strong from 2021 all the way through uh, mid to late 2022. Then all of a sudden we started to have weakness. Now it stopped making lower lows and it stopped making higher highs. So the, the important part in this picture is that it has to challenge this right shoulder. If it gets above that, then we might see it challenge the highs that we saw from back in October 2022. But for now, uh, it just feels like there's still some pressure there to the downside. And again, a weak dollar would help out the economy, would help out commodities, well, help out share prices, particularly the equity markets, and help out some of the commodity space. So uh, we'll start with silver, since that was uh, actually right now is one of my biggest holdings is SLV. I had a 3.67% gain today on silver at $22.30. So uh, my average price is 22 so fine with me. Uh, I've been selling calls against my position anyway. My calls are at 22.50. So I still have a little bit of room to capitalize on some gains. Those options expire on next Friday. This the 16th is when my options expire. So still got a um, still got a little bit to go here on my options position. But all in all, things looking really good. And in the grand scheme of things, if we zoom out, you know you. You had that nice sell-off, which really lasted for about a year and a half, almost two years, and now we are starting to see a slight uptrend form. And we discussed this pullback on silver. I actually anticipated stopping somewhere at that yellow box up near the top of the chart, um, but it didn't, right? Kind of went right through that. All right, fine. Um, you know, technical analysis works until it doesn't. So I was anticipating it stopping, basing for a little bit and rallying. Well, it dropped through that, and now we're getting that base and rally out, rally out of it. So hopefully this will continue on, particularly for my position. Um, the challenge will be next is getting up to that about twenty three seventy five level for the for SLV. 
after that, you know, I'll, I'll worry about those highs when we get there. But that's the that's the targeted path. And because we look at impulse and corrective phases, right now we are finishing up what looks like a corrective phase. Now we should see an impulse phase. And based off of these moves, you know, a lot of people like to look at um, measuring objects and calculated moves. Let's just do from the uh, bottom to the peak to where we retrace back down to. That would put a price target on SLV at about $26.40. So that's just based off of a Fibonacci extension line. I'll put a horizontal line right there so I can remove that one and uh, we'll keep an eye on that going forward because that might be a, a decent target, which lines up pretty much with those highs we saw from back in 2020. So perfect. All right, so that's your silver. Let me work my way up from the bottom because not all commodities were impacted. Of course, you had crude oil down 2.23%. You would have thought that the production cuts might have helped out um, the price of crude oil and caused that to move up a little bit. Well, no. Uh, today, given back those gains from the production cut news, um, let's go back here and show you the, this is the weekly. I want to show you the daily. All right, so you had the production cut on right here with this big gap up, almost an overhead supply on the 5th of June, that was Monday, and really just been weakening ever since. Now, I guess the saving grace for today would be have this long bottoming tail here on today's trading activity, which is a positive sign that things rallied back up. It's uh, near the close, but all in all, a rather bearish day for crude oil and XLE as well for anybody who's trading energy. Here's your XLE, which uh, has a nice little hanging man formation as we speak. All right, moving up our list, that was seventh place. Russell 2000 just really been doing odd things. Completely the opposite direction of the markets overall. We had weakness the past couple of days in the equity indexes like the NASDAQ and the S&P, but Russell surged. Today, we had nice moves up in the S&P and the NASDAQ and the Russell dropped. So down 0.48% for the Russell, which seems to want to beat to a tune of a different drum right now. We still are inside, near almost dead middle of this giant range that we've had mapped out for quite some time on here. Hopefully, Tom, you're back at it with the um, Russell 2000. Here's your Dow, which I just have because people voted it in a couple years ago. I, and what we might want to do, you guys let me know. Um, do you want to change up the seven? I don't want to add in too many because I'll end up doing you know, a one-hour show just on going over the top major market indexes. I know that uh, there's been some of you who asked to have like the... The Nifty in there, right? Which is an Indian index. I, I don't, I don't have that much of a viewer base over there, so I don't want to do it just for a couple people. But if there's a bunch of you that say, "Hey, let's add this to the list of your top seven, I'm happy to modify it. As you guys can see, my top seven that I usually go through is crude oil, Russell, Dow, Bitcoin, S and P, gold, and the Nasdaq. There's something else. I don't want to do an individual security either, so no, no I'm not going to put Tesla on there or put that type of stuff. But if you want. Uh, an ETF, an index, or some market segment, I'm, uh, I'm happy to put it to a vote and consider it because ultimately you guys are the ones that determine what we're going to analyze on this program by typing in a chat. So if you have some comments on that, just let me know, type it in a chat, and I will uh, do my best to incorporate that into the show. So that was your Dow. Technically, meh, I don't care. Bitcoin, 0.54% gain today. Nothing really has changed. It still feels it still feels rather weak. You know, you can tell by we we're making lower highs ever since this April 14th peak. It's just been drifting lower and lower, lower lows, lower highs. So while it was positive today, the bias, in my opinion, would still be to the downside, particularly with all the regulatory environment that we talked about with John O'Donnell on yesterday's show. Uh, 24,545 is where I think we're headed to on Bitcoin. All right, S&P 500. Uh, this one was really interesting because it's it's almost making a, okay, I got to take a step back here. I'm sure that many of you in your, your days as a trader have heard or dealt with somebody who kind of creates some weird name for something, right? The, like, for example, in Japanese candlesticks, there's a pattern called the falling window or the abandoned baby. Sounds it's kind of mean. Well, there's a megaphone pattern I had a, heard a trader talk about years ago. And I was like, okay, a megaphone pattern. And what he talked about was that it's just a sign that things are heating up and you're getting a lot of action. But you could make the argument that prices right now on the S&P are forming a bit of a megaphone pattern, right? You've got this kind of inverse pennant formation, right? It's just the backwards of a pennant formation. Therefore, you're going to start seeing bigger swings. Now, I don't put much weight on that at all. It's really nothing that I, I think is that... Uh, trustworthy from a consistency perspective, but it is an interesting pattern that's forming right now on that S&P. And what that means for me personally is 
it just gives me a lack of confidence about which direction it's going to be going. I mean, we're having a green candle, red candle, green candle, red candle, green candle. Well, based off this, tomorrow we should probably gap up and then see markets sell off. I mean, just based off the last five days of trading activity. The other part of this, which leads me to believe if I had to pick a direction to the upside would be the impulse moves we saw from last Thursday and Friday. This week has been consolidation, but no real profit taking. So when you have a big impulse move without profit taking, that means that the, the sellers aren't getting rid of it. Therefore, you don't have supply coming to the marketplace and prices tend to move higher. So just keep your eye on the S&P. Even though we're sitting in this overhead supply zone, which goes all the way back to the August 22 highs, um, even though we're sitting there, it's the more it stays in that zone, the more it chops up and takes away those buy or those sellers out of the equation and probability increases that this thing's gonna be moving to the upside. So that's what I've got for the S&P 500, looking rather bullish, even though it's sitting at supply, it hasn't had its aggressive sell-off yet. Okay, moving on to gold. We talked about silver, let's go to the big brother here, which is gold futures. Yesterday, we had a pretty ugly day. Well, today, pretty much erased all of those losses. Had a nice positive day of 1.03% for gold today, but technically, you look at where it's at, it's almost in no man's land, just kind of traversing sideways for the past three weeks, not near any real strong demand or supply zones on gold. So that's your, your second place finisher, the silver medal for Mr. Gold. And finally, you got the NASDAQ 100, which had a, a great down day yesterday and today, I'd argue a pretty darn good day to the upside. 1.2% gain for the NASDAQ today. We'll see if it challenges those highs. You know, this is another one that when we zoom out a little bit, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic it's going to hit this overhead supply level to right around 15,058. That's where the, the beginning of that supply zone works, which is about another 400 plus points away from current, actually 500 points away from current level. Yeah, I did say CL was down. Yeah? Yep, there's your CL down. Bellevue, Washington. Hey, good to see you, John. So yeah, NASDAQ, um, you know, recouping those losses. It's tricky, you know, I can, as, as a trader, you have to be flexible and kind of have an ambigu ambiguous approach or viewpoint of the markets. For example, yesterday, um, actually on Monday's show, I was saying, I think the markets will probably start to sell off on Thursday. Well, we got that big sell off yesterday, which did what I thought it was going to do. But, you know, when it sells off, where do you think it's gonna go to? And the logical point would be these most recent lows, which is exactly where we hit today. So, you know, fairly logical bounce for this, for the NASDAQ 100. Again, after we break that, or if we break that level on the NASDAQ 100, you do have quite a bit of a drop before we start to see any real area of demand that might prop price back up. So keep your eye on this 14,255 level if you're trading the queues. Uh, that part right there, if it's broken, I think you'll see a pretty sharp decline, but uh, fully anticipated there being a little bit of a bounce here on today. Can I look at Google for Dave? Sure. Since I ran through the top seven, I didn't look at the bond markets yet, but we'll let's get this off of here, get some of my lines out. All right, so as far as Google goes, um, you mean Alphabet, right? Well, we'll always call it Google unless you're unless you just jumped in the markets today. It's called Alphabet. Um, okay, so from a technical perspective, what am I looking at? Well, you know, the only thing that really catches my eye before that yellow zone down below is right there. And, and it's just a spinning top. We had a gap down, you had a spinning top on May 24th, and then it jumped up out of it. So this is technically, if we look at, if I zoom in, that little candle right here that my cursor is moving on, that's what's called a um, island reversal. Now it is only a one day island reversal, but you typically don't get a gap down like this or vice versa, a big gap up, and then it gaps the opposite direction. Well, that's what we had um, on this day, which was May 24th. So I'm using that as kind of the, the logical target for current price, and I'll be honest, we're pretty much there. If I was to map out the zone, which would give me the Let's see, the opening price of that candle was 121.88, and here we are at 122.67. So we're pretty much there on Google. Overall, you know, I'm bullish on it. I think you're gonna expect a pullback here. I think it'll probably, it might drift slightly lower, but the candle for today kind of feels like it's a reversal formation. You know, the challenging part here is Google having a relatively bad couple of days while you have the NASDAQ rally up. And then if you use TradingView, you can click down here and it's nice because it'll give you some of the uh, some of the justification or at least headlines for that specific stock. So all in all, feeling um, 
somewhat bullish on Google. I do see a very small demand zone right around 121 to one, uh, 120.78 to 121.88. And then you have the bigger demand zone, which is much lower, which is right after it gapped up. <clears throat> Tesla went crazy after the close, right? So good Tesla. I don't know if it went crazy, but just had a good day. And it's, I'm kicking myself because you guys know I, I had the, uh, I forget which one was my final, but I think I had like the 120 uh, call, or 120 put sold was exercised, ended up selling at 180, ended up having a great trade there. But boy, I'm not kicking myself because I got out at 180. But three words that don't exist in trading and mean nothing, shoulda, coulda, and woulda. So um, looking at where we are right now, we're at 142, which is up here. You know, the logical area for it to stop would have been right around 133, which is this high that goes back to November 1st. That's where I would have been, you know, looking to either exit my trade after this big rally here. That certainly would have been one of the more important areas to exit the trade. However, uh, it didn't it didn't stop. I mean, hesitated for a second, then ripped right through it. Now, whatever that news may be, and I didn't see what the news was, but uh, I'm sure it's some partnership or something with EV, supercharged, whatever. Uh, now you got to start thinking about these higher levels moving up. There is an unfilled gap that goes all the way back to the 20, in the 30th of September. Switch this over to weekly here. Just so I can see better. All right, so what you have is basically a cup and handle formation that's now broken out. And if you were to do a traditional cup and handle formation, again, uh, technical analysis can be somewhat subjective, but I'll just measure this out and see where it might project to. Let's do trend line from the bottom of that cup to the top. And it would give us a target on a breakout here of right around 314 for Tesla based off a cup and handle breakout, which is right into the exact highs that you saw from September 19th. So kind of a, a nice lineup of numbers here if you're trading the technical side. That is pretty much your, your target there. So not... Um, not too bad. Actually, it makes me feel rather bullish on Tesla right now. Kind of kicking myself for getting out of those shares. So, will Hood ever be bought out? Um, I mean, obviously, I, I don't know. I, I thought it would be, kind of felt like it should be, just as assets would probably be a, uh, a good buyout opportunity. Right now, it's just been listing sideways and doing nothing, right? We've seen sideways action for, for over a year now. It's been just dead in the water. So... Could it be bought out? Sure. Someone would probably want to buy it out for its database, grab all those users and make themselves bigger. Uh, typically, you're going to see those types of merger and acquisitions when things are robust and markets are good. At this point now, I would say markets aren't that robust. Yes, they're starting to trend back up and there, there may be some opportunity. But given the jitters that the banking issues have caused us, I don't see any financial firms really taking a stretch to do any M&A activity at this moment in time just because they don't want to take that risk with their capital. Unless there's something that's so compelling in the Robinhood balance sheet or that user base, which could help out their business, then uh, then I don't think that they would be making that offer. At this point, um, you know, if I was if I was a, a big player, Schwab or J.P. Morgan or something, I would be looking at Hood, but I would be waiting for the markets to sell off of it and see if I could get them in a real pain point. So, if you look at the demographics, Hood is a very younger, a much younger financial base it doesn't have a lot of money and if the markets start to tank they may start to pull their assets out of hood because they need those assets to to live off of and if that does happen the price of robin hood could fall even more and that may be one of the considerations again i am not an MA expert i don't look at merger and acquisition stuff never been anything to me um hood would be an interesting acquisition for x aka paypal it, Tom, I 100% agree with you. That, 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 I think that'd be actually the, the favorite target right now. So if you are um, the former Twitter, right, which now Elon Musk has said that company X, which is Twitter, that he wants to turn that into a financial firm. Well, to, he could easily incorporate Robinhood right now into that model. So I agree with you, Tom. I think if it's going to happen, it would most likely happen from somebody like Elon Musk and from his new venture, which is a private firm. So what would be interesting there is Robinhood gets bought and goes private. Now, the question is down the road, what 2025, maybe late 2024, most likely 2025, you get this company X. Does it spend Start with everything in one as an IPO, or does it do an IPO and spin off multiple different company segments? I'm not sure which way that would go. 
Um, but Elon Musk has made it very clear that he wants to do something as a financial services industry for X. I gave, I'll call it, tw I'm gonna call it Twitter for now. Um, just because it's easier for people to remember. Because if I say the symbol X, it's US Steel. Um, so if Twitter does go down that route, they're gonna need someone. He could start it all from scratch, but why not just immediately get your user base and everybody who's got assets and funds and everything. Um, I don't think it would be a problem for him to open up those services on Twitter and advertise and all of a sudden have millions of people signing up for Twitter's financial stuff, but this would be a big jump start for his financial services firm. So yeah, I, I think that's probably the most logical one would be Twitter buying Robinhood. Just a question of, you know, does it go private? Do they keep it the same? Um, he does. He really does. You know, it's so funny. I talked to a friend of mine the other day. Margaret says uh, Elon Musk makes financial markets exciting. Not just financial markets, but just the commentary he gives. Like um, he was showing the stats for some of the things that have happened on Twitter recently. Like how many people logged in to see DeSantis's panel discussion? Uh, how many logged in to see the JFK Jr. Um, or Robert Kennedy um, spaces? I logged into both of those just to see what those different candidates are saying. They have tens of millions. I think Carson... Was it Tucker Carlson had like 34 million people in the first week on his, whereas mainstream media, nowhere even close to it. And he's like, death, death with the mainstream media. I'm like, wow, you know, if he can corner that market and get more and more people to use Twitter or whatever company he wants to call it, it'll be easy to convert them to a financial services company. So yeah, I am uh, love it. I, I think it's great. He might be crazy. You know, I love the fact he goes on Joe Rogan and smokes a big joint with Joe Rogan, kind of a, a middle finger to the industry like, I'm getting stuff done. I'll do what I want to do. Smoking a little pot's not going to hurt me at all. So anyway, thought that was pretty fun. What else do I have here? Um, well, hold on. My favorite chart pattern is the praying mantis coming off a of smoking opium. <laughs> there you go, believable. You know what? You should trademark those, draw the picture out, and start selling it. I mean, you, you, everybody's selling books nowadays. You could probably do pretty well and make some money off of that. So <laughs> funny. Um. So with regards to today's activity, obviously the dollar was the main story. And the big question that I have, and, and I, I think I know the answer, but the big question is, where is that dollar going to go from here? We'll have to wait and see. This is a weekly time frame, but just looking at the weekly, uh, it looks very bearish in my opinion, because you're not making higher highs, you're making lower highs, and you're making the same lows. So that is like dropping the ball, the, you know, the tennis ball on the concrete. Every time it bounces, it's less and less and less and less. And that's why I put a line above this shoulder. If it breaks 106.20, okay, fine. It'll be moving to the upside. But for now, it is dropping lower and lower and lower. Now, if I look at it on the daily, while I do think it's going to be going lower on this weekly, the daily looks like it's gonna come into this level down just slightly lower, right around 103, potentially bounce, and then the question will be, do we break the high that we just established you know, a week ago? So it's this fractal nature of markets. You know, you look at that bigger picture, I'm bearish. You look at the shorter term picture, like real short term, I'm talking a month, I'm bullish. So yes, I can be conflicting, and it all depends on what my time frame is and what I'm looking to achieve as a trader. In this case, my positions are built off the bigger, bigger picture. As you guys know, I'm long SLV. I've mentioned that many times. I have a very large position in SLV right now. And not only am I bullish on silver, but I'm also selling calls against that position to, to lower my cost basis and generate more income. So part of the reason I'm bullish on it is, well, I believe long-term silver will do fine. Plus, you know, looking back over the past, you call it a year now, silver has had some volatility, but it's also been making higher highs and higher lows. So I'm, I'm bullish on it for the longer term. Therefore, I got to look at this dollar index on the longer term as well. The dollar index is going to be the inverse. And here we're seeing weaker dollars. So I think that'll be a catalyst for gold and silver and other commodities going forward. Uh, the picture would be me screaming at my mother. Oh, my monitor. I thought I, my eyes are bad. Believe all the side. I thought you said screaming at your mother. I was like, let's not yell at your mom, at your monitor. And I get it. Um, you know, in one of the chapters that I wrote, which, you know, I've got this whole hodgepodge of stories in my in my book that I'll probably never finish. Um, one of them is we used to play a game called Scrabble on the old trading floor. When you have like, you know, 180 people on the trading floor, you have all kinds of personality types. I'm sure you guys saw it when you took classes. If you went and took physical classes at OTA, you know, you got 20 to 30 people in those rooms and you get some people that are very quiet, calm, courteous. You get some that don't shut up. They just ask questions all the time. You get some that are totally confrontational and try to contradict everything that the instructor says. You get some that were very helpful and all of a sudden they're like an assistant teacher. So you get personality types all over the place. Well, we had a couple people on the floor that had aggression issues. 
One in particular was rather roided up. He was a young kid. He was just just stacked bodybuilder guy. And when he would have a bad trade, everybody knew about it because he would take his keyboard and he would just start smashing it on his desk and key, uh, the, the letters would be flying all over the place. We called, that was called playing Scrabble on the old trading floor days. I used to punch my keyboard when I had a really bad trade and it didn't do so good for my knuckles. And I realized, just be calm, let it go. Anyway, sorry, to bore you with the stories. Let me uh, dive one step deeper and talk about, um, I had two, only two questions that came through, so I will look at those. Before I dive into the questions, I'm going to do a gratuitous plug. I don't do a lot of these ones, but um, I know that I have some of you who are in Las Vegas or may be in Las Vegas. I will be presenting at the Investment Masters Symposium. I look forward to these ones. Um, there's a bunch of different shows that they do. So the Money Show does this one. Then there's the Trading Expo. The Trading Expo is much more active trading and you know systems and things like that. Uh, this one will be August 8th through 10th. Uh, that's going to be in, at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, they asked me to do a presentation on crypto, so I'm doing one called Building a Crypto Portfolio to Prepare for the Future, which is probably going to be rather timely at this moment in time. So I will, uh, I'll be in Vegas. If you guys happen to be in Vegas, let me know. You can always email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Maybe we'll do, a, I don't know, have, have meet up and have a drink somewhere. Orange juice for those of you who don't drink. That's fine. I get it. Um, but yeah, that'll be a fun one. If you're in Las Vegas, check it out. You can go to the moneyshow.com. There's a ton of other presenters, a lot of different things at this expo from, you know, REITs to energy investments to alternative investments in gold and silver and oil. It's, it's kind of a fun show. I like walking on the floor and learning what's out there in the industry, but I'll be giving a presentation. No booth for me, but I will be in Vegas. Um, why they do away with the trading floor at OTA? So you want to know the, the, the honest truth? It's pretty simple. Let me take a shot of whiskey before I tell you this story. Uh, how much time do I got? Okay, I got to do a shorter show today just because I'm hosting trivia tonight, by the way. The next two weeks, if anybody here is in Orange County, uh, I will be hosting trivia at the uh, Brewer, Brewing, Brewer's Reserve of California. It's called BRC. It's in Costa Mesa. Uh, I will be hosting trivia tonight at 6.30. So if anybody wants to come and be tortured with my bad trivia, come on down there. Uh, I'm also hosting trivia the 8th and the 15th. So tonight and then next Thursday as well. So I'm, I'm getting my trivia rounds ready. Anyway, why did they close the trading floor? Well, it's a good question. And what we had, um, Ivan, years ago was the trading floor model was novel. So you had institutional trading floors, right? So you had like your JP Morgan, your Goldman Sachs trading floors, which you and I will never set foot on, right? Those are guarded from high above multiple security checkpoints to get onto the actual institutional trading floors. Not not the NYSE or CME stuff. I'm talking the trading firms trading floor. So what happened in 1998 is the regulations changed and we can now do direct access trading, right? There's new technology that allowed you and I to use these things called electronic communication networks, ECNs. So those ECNs all of a sudden allowed everybody to do exactly what market makers could do. So it created this point where people were rushing to use this technology because it did give you a competitive advantage back then. However, we didn't have the internet connections at home. We were still using dial-up. So you try doing high-speed trading on a dial-up modem at home. There wasn't T1s to people's houses. So this AL started a trading floor and he set up the T1 lines to the to the trading floor, put in a whole bunch of computers and he rented those stations out. And if you did more than, let's say 20 trade, or I think it was, I think you had to do 20 trades a day to have your seat reserved, right? If you didn't, it was, then it was luck of the draw, good luck, sit where you can. So mine was reserved because I did more than 20 trades a day. And of course, they were charging $10 commissions. So 20 trades a day, 10 bucks uh, a trade. I was doing minimum $200 worth of transactional volume for the floor every day. Now you add on 180 traders. It was just a money machine. What started to happen is the, the commission structure started to drop. Competition started increasing. More firms were now doing bucket shops, which is really what it was, trading floors. And all of a sudden, commissions dropped to like five bucks or maybe even lower than that. So the profit margins diminished greatly. And then when the 9-11 attack happened, the, the economy was already pretty bad in, in 2000, right? It was really starting to fall apart. A lot of people just didn't have the money to trade anymore. The trading floor building was really expensive. So it went from 180 traders down to like 50. Um, honestly, most of the people were blowing their accounts doing stupid stuff, which is where I learned so much is watching hundreds of people blow their accounts doing dumb crap. So. 
there wasn't a lot of people there to maintain the trading floor anymore. And then it went into, you know, you go into your recession from 2001 to 2003, shut down the trading floor. So there you go, Ivan. That was the, the abbreviated version of why the trading floor got shut down. Ganesh says, if, if some trading patterns are so obvious, won't the big money do the opposite of what the chart says? So how can you rely on the charts when big money is looking at the same chart? Well, it's a good point, Ganesh. And yes, there's always that possibility that if I see a hammer formation or shooting star or the abandoned baby or a pennant formation, ascending, descending triangles, wedge, whatever you want to call them, there's always the possibility that some whale out there with a massive amount of money is going to look at that and go, watch this. We'll make the retail traders scream and just bam, crush it, right? That's always a possibility. So to, to your point, what's to stop that from happening? Absolutely nothing. It's, it's very probable that that could happen. But for us, we put protections in place in case it does. See, I'm trading on these patterns based off the, the premise that it's behavioral analysis. When I see a certain formation on a chart, it's reflecting the collective psychology, not just of you and I, but also institutional traders because they're out there moving prices as well. So they may be part of the group that's creating these patterns. And if I'm wrong, and let's say we, we have whatever, a head and shoulders pattern and it starts to trigger, it gets me in the trade and all of a sudden it screams against me. We put stop losses in place so that we don't get burned on those types of things. So, you know, it's just, it's willing to accept that we're wrong. Very simply, it's okay to be wrong. That's why you put your stops in the system. You know, manual stops, don't, don't use manual stops. Put in hard stops in the system so they're there and the computer does it automatically, right? A manual stop, yeah, a manual stop is the reason that I'm alive today. It's the rhythm method gone wrong. Rhythm method doesn't work. I'm proof of that. Uh, let's see. Merlin, when you were in Vegas for the money show, do you ever offer to have a drink with me? I feel a lot. I'm there. You're welcome to come join me and have a drink. I, I, I didn't have time the last one. I think I was there for that one thing. We can go have a drink. It's fine. Let's go do it. Uh, it would have been a great learning experience. Thanks for Yeah. Ivan, it was a, an amazing learning experience. It really was one of the most incredible things of my life. I, I, I got there totally by accident. And, you know, long story short, guys, when I first got into direct access trading, so I started trading in 1996 when I was in college. I was just investing long term, which didn't fit my personality type. And I graduated college and I don't want to take the whole story, but I, I found these trading schools. One was in New York, one was in Dallas, and one was in uh, Irvine, California. So I drove down to Irvine, California and saw what was going on, did a little tour of the trading floor. I went back up and I talked to all my professors who I held in high regards. Every single one of them said, don't do it. It's a scam. It's a scam. You're going to lose. You're going to just get scammed. Don't do it. Don't do it. In hindsight, I got to look back and I wish I could reach out to each one of those instructors and chastise them right? Give them shit because you guys told me this was a scam. It's not. It was a, a better way to access the markets versus what you guys knew or didn't know apparently about how these markets work. So I got really lucky to have fallen into that environment. Not only that, but just some of the people I've met. You know, John O'Donnell was literally the first person I met down there. And I'll, uh, I'll save that story for the book. It's a pretty funny one. But yeah, there, that was probably the best learning lesson of my life was that uh, let's see, that was 1998, it was June, and I left, I think I left in May, March or May of 20, 2001. I went over to Italy to teach over there. So yeah, it was an awesome experience. Anyway, um, so there you go, my gratuitous plug that turned into some storytelling. But August 8th through 10th, um, I, will be in, I will be there the evening of the 8th. My presentation is on the 9th, and I will be leaving the morning of the 10th. Okay. Let me go and see if I, I, one of the two questions that I had. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Margaret says, what is the setup that you teach at this trading show? Are you on a big stage? Do you lecture all day? How many people do you teach? It's just a, like a one hour, it might even be just like a 45 minute presentation. It's a, it's a quick thing. Uh, you know, maybe afterwards, if there's enough people, we can go and, and have a lengthier discussion because I really don't have anything else to do. I was planning on going to a bunch of the other presenters and just kind of seeing what's out there. Uh, but I have a 45 minute presentation. Um, I'm not going to be on a huge stage. You, you, a lot of time it's like a breakout room. There's enough chairs for, I mean, last time we were there, there was enough chairs for probably, I don't know, maybe 75, 80 people. And there was probably 20 people in the room. So it really wasn't that packed. But uh, the whole trade show was the last one I went to was a bit flat, and I think that's just because of the timing of COVID. Um, the only reason that this one might be less attended is it's during the week, right? The 8th, 9th, and 10th is like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 
not the best days to go to Vegas, but uh, should be fun either way. Okay, so let me real quickly go through the two questions I got. Thomas, thoughts on Nicola? Uh, will it be a buy at some point? Okay, so Nicola, we talked about years ago, literally years ago at this point, when we said dump it, it's gonna go to zero, and we're pretty much there. This was a SPAC that started at 10 bucks, spike up to what, 95, uh, 94. And then all of a sudden just fell apart. Turned out it was a, you know, a bunch of fraudulent activity going on. And who knows if they even have the assets they say. You know, you look at this price chart here at 61 cents. And, you know, your mind is going to tell you that the, the video and material that you saw from Nikola, you're like, wow, what an amazing company, 60 cents. Well, let's see. Uh, let's go look at the Nikola Corporation. I mean, they're, let's see if their webpage has even changed over the years. Nikola Motors. As Elon Musk has said repeatedly, especially to a lot of people in the industry, getting the idea for an electric car is not the hard part, right? You, you can design one. It's getting it into production and making, you know, getting past the production and development point to actual roadworthy vehicles and then getting people to buy them. That, that's where the hard part was, at least Elon Musk is saying. So, you know, you look at this, this Nikola website, it looks great, right? It looks awesome. Beautiful trucks, it's got a nice, I like the concept, they're really cool looking, but are they selling any? Are they moving? Are they losing money? I don't know, I haven't looked at the fundamentals. So I would say, Thomas, if you're looking at Nikola, make sure you look at the fundamentals, right? So their earnings, they've, they're losing, they've lost last quarter, it seems like they're losing less. However, the price chart is just dying. Is it worth the risk to buy some Nikola? Um, I would say this is, would be a gamble account. If you got, you know, a thousand bucks, you're like, I'll take a flyer on it. Okay, fine. Go for it. You, know, you might be able to grab yourself, what, 1,500 shares, something like that of, of Nikola, and maybe something good comes out of it. But for right now, I hate to say it, the chart looks like it's going into bankruptcy because if this was a good, solid company, the smart money would be coming in and buying this thing up, and they're not. You know, So this is one of the reasons that I, I err on the side of caution, and I would start putting lines on you know, the peaks. So if you're looking at buying into Nikola, I put some two red lines on here. Well, maybe you wait for those to be breached. And until they're breached, don't do anything. You know what? You set yourself an alert and say, okay, if it gets to 85, I'll buy in. And I know what you're thinking, Thomas. You're like, well, if I bought it at 61 and it got to 85, you know, that's a 50% gain. Well, well, 47% gain. Yes, it is. But it could go lower. And the probability, in my opinion, is higher that this goes lower just because what the trend is. Yeah, that's the itty, itty bitty, itty bitty, bitty, bitty bend at the end, right? Just a tiny little hook, but it hasn't broken any highs here, so it's a total risk, Thomas. I personally wouldn't do it. Um, you know, I would, but again, I'd look at the fundamentals if you were that type of person and see what's their book value, right? Are the assets of this company worth more than 60 cents? Then, then maybe it will be acquired by somebody someday. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to jump into that EV space and EV trucks, what I tell you, in, in listening to, um, uh, oh man, okay, you guys gotta help me here. There's that uh, car company that's out of Waymo. Uh, I was drawing blanks. Waymo is already going into this space as well. And the, the interview I watched with the CEO from Waymo or engineer from Waymo was amazing. Like really amazing. If you go to Lex Friedman um, and just type in Waymo, you'll see that. Hmm, that was weird. Looks like my. Video disconnected. All right, well, it shows I'm connected now. That was kind of weird. So anyway, I'm not sure what, what happened there. I'll, I'll see if I'm, I'm actually streaming live for you guys. It looked like I had a little bit of a, a blip on there. So it's a gamble. Again, I, don't, I personally wouldn't do it. I think that there's other companies out there that might be better. Long-winded answer to your question, Thomas. Sorry if there was a glitch, but no. Uh. All right, let's go to the last question here, and then we'll wrap things up. This is from Scott D. This is on the YouTube channel. So thank you, Scott, for this one. And again, anybody, if you have questions, you can put them down below any YouTube video. doesn't matter which one. If you watched one of my videos from a year ago on a trade plan or something, great. Go for it. Um, I would be happy to uh, look at that and put those questions on there. So Scott D. says, idea for tomorrow. What are your thoughts on Cosmos? Adam, does it have a future? So this is one of those cryptos, the layer one cryptos that I am a fan of. I have to say it would probably be, obviously, Ethereum is my number one. Atom or Cosmos would probably be my number two. And the only reason I say that, Scott, is because 
If you look at a layer one technology, like an Ethereum or Cardano, an Algorand, Solana, Sui, Aptos, these are all the base layer blockchains, which again are only there for two purposes. Number one is to secure all the transactions on that blockchain and to make sure that they're safe, right? Record everything and make sure that that thing is safe from outside manipulation. And that's the main two goals of any one of these blockchains. Now, each one of them is gonna have different characteristics, different transactions per second, uh, how many transactions can fit in each block of data, how big the blocks of data are, how quick their block times are. So all of that becomes very different depending on which blockchain you're using. One of the challenges that I see, and I think it's gonna be the bigger challenge going forward, is the interoperability of blockchains. For example, I think I've used this before for you guys. Right now, we're all HTTP. It's a standardized hypertext transfer protocol, right? That's the backbone of the internet. Without that, if we all had, let's say, a different type of system of, of, of connecting, we wouldn't be able to communicate together. I might not be able to talk to Ricardo here because he was on a different internet protocol, but we standardized that. So the crypto world has a challenge with so many different technologies, proof of work, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, directed acyclic graph, tags, tangles. There's so many different technologies and one's not going to communicate with the other. One of the main reasons I like Cosmos is they have an SDK, which is a software developer's kit. So they've built this technology that allows you to very quickly and easily start up projects on Cosmos. But also they work with interoperability where their chain will communicate with other blockchains. And I think that that's one of the keys going forward. So Scott, that's my long-winded answer to uh, your Cosmos Adam question. I'm a fan, I like it. And I think that uh, it, it has, it, I think it definitely has a future um, going forward. All really depends on the regulators, right? I think that they just didn't, I think uh, Cosmos was declared a security by the SEC. I, I think, I'm not sure on that one. Uh, I remember when American Airlines in bankruptcy was selling for 25 cents to 40 cents per share. Uh, I had advice to buy it at 50, wish I did. Well, if it goes through bankruptcy, quite often it will, the, your shares get erased and then it starts up again. So it's just because it's, it's said they're going through bankruptcy doesn't mean you get to keep your shares. If it goes bankrupt, your shares are worthless and gone. And then what they'll do is they'll start back up. That happened with the company, I think it was Dry Ships. Um, I had one years ago where I just had some shares, I kept it, and they went bankrupt. My shares were worth nothing. And then all of a sudden I looked at the share price and was like, I would have made so much money that, oh yeah, well you don't have those shares because we went bankrupt and we had new shares. It started all over again. So make sure that that was the case with American Airlines. I'm not 100% sure on how that one happened. Um, yeah, AAL, American Airlines, not Alcoa. <laughs> um, Tom says, Tesla's up because they are now part, I knew it was a partnering, partnering with Ford and GM on charging network uh, should help shore up the Tesla charging network. So yeah, um, but that was, that's old news. The, the Tesla teaming up with Ford one came out a few days ago. So that was rallying that one, but maybe the GM one is new. And this goes just to my point about the internet right here. How are you going to increase value for Tesla? If all of a sudden Ford and GM and Tesla are now all going to work to build out the infrastructure using their charging stations, then you, you've kind of created this, this group of three that's now competing against everybody else. So now what's Toyota and Honda and Nissan and, and Chevrolet going to do? Well, GM, Chevy's GM. Um, Volkswagen going to do, right? They're, they're, they're separate companies. They either join that network, which is probably the smart thing to do, so you have a universal charging system, or we now start to have three or four different types of charging system in the networks across the U.S., which would just be stupid and cumbersome, right? It makes sense for them to have one network, one plug for all the vehicles. This is what you use. Standardize that thing would make it amazing. Um, but that would make sense as to why they're surging. I knew that's why they've been surging over the past week or so is because of the Ford news. I didn't know that uh, GM was jumping on that ship as well. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Let's go to your Forex factory calendar for tomorrow. Earnings wise, there was really nothing happening on Friday, so I will skip that. Now, here is your calendar for tomorrow. You have nothing going on for the U.S. for Friday, but my Canadian friends, you do have your unemployment rate and employment change. The stuff that happened today, you can see here you had the unemployment claims, which was much higher than expected, but really not that big of a deal. And there wasn't much driving factor here for the U.S. markets either. So kind of a boring day. GM, Honda, and Subaru all have an e-alliance. Okay. But are they going to build that infrastructure together? That's, that's the piece that's important. You know, once you have everybody working together for the... If they were smart, they'd say, yes, we're competing to make the cars. So our cars will be different, but let's all agree on the charging station. Imagine how much better... A, an interconnected United States charging system would be if every station had the same technology. Oh, 
It'd be great. It actually might inspire me to get an electric vehicle. Right now, it just seems like, well, I got to use this one or I use that one. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Saw so my first Rivian made Amazon. Ooh, wow, really? I'd like to see that. I didn't know they. I didn't know that. Um, I like the Rivians. I've seen them around here. They're a bunch in the neighborhood. Pretty cool. All right. Anyway, guys, I got to wrap up. I got to go get ready for my trivia tonight. So, uh, ooh, dogs like that one. Uh, Getting ready for my trivia tonight. I, again, I will be teaching at UCI tomorrow, so I will not be uh, doing a show tomorrow. I will see you guys on Monday. So I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. If you have any comments, questions, feedback, whatever, want topics for Monday's show, send them on in at TraderMerlin at gmail.com or put it down below any of the YouTube videos. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Hope that dollar keeps tanking for you and for my silver position. I'll see you on Monday. Take care, everyone. What are you doing?